Thomas for Darwin. Uh, so um, I have been asked to introduce the lecture and our lecturer today. Um, I will be as brief as I can. Uh, we're very happy to uh, host Gaspar Miklos Tamas. Uh, he is a Hungarian philosopher, essayist, part-time political analyst. Um, he has contributed uh, theoretical work in a wide uh, range of topics. Some of his more notable and noticeable works have included uh, analyses of um, the, uh, his uh, famous uh, or quite well-known study of the class problem, analyses of uh, class dynamics in um, socialist and post-socialist uh, Eastern European countries, and of course the uh, well-known work on post-fascism. Um, this lecture is actually part of two um, events. One is our uh, Iskra's uh, seminar, um, which uh, is uh, going on on a weekly basis. This is now the third lecture. Um, and the other is uh, our international conference where we have invited a number of um, students and youth uh, socialist groups to participate in a regional meeting um, and discuss the problems of organizing um, internationally today and specifically in the Balkan region. Um, so in these two events, um, we have asked Gaspar to uh, give us a talk on the idea of emancipation. I won't introduce your topic particularly. You'll uh, do that yourself. So without any further ado. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be speaking totally freely because my notes have been lost together with other things I've lost here in a briefcase and but I hope I will remember them and <clears throat> I will start to remind you of uh, Marx's famous writing on the Jewish question which is the basis of uh, any self-respecting talk about the topic of emancipation. And I won't uh, give you an outline of its contents. I suppose that is more or less well known, but I, I'll, I'll give you a few ideas with which I will be uh, dealing here. Uh, Marx's problem there has been how to evaluate the idea that a well-organized liberal but non-democratic state of the period, Russia, uh, would decide to lift the discriminatory measures against one group of people in that state, Jews, would that constitute, he asked himself, and in a polemics, in the famous polemics, Bruno Bauer and others, uh, how to evaluate the, uh, the, the import and the prospects uh, ensuing from such a state act to lift the discrimin discriminatory regulations and measures <coughs> of one group. Is that a progress? Or if it is a progress, it is the progress that he, as a critical thinker, and some of the desires of general emancipation should support. As is well known, he said that uh, emancipation of a religious group, uh, the lifting of legal impediments in the way of the integration of a religious group in a modern society, a theme that is familiar to us still after 150 years or more. Anyway, uh, that is offering a privilege. Even if this privilege is liberating for the concerned, 
what it does to emphasize further the need for emancipation for the whole society from such impediments, also in the sense of obliterating those boundaries between human groups that the liberals want to lift, want to relativize, want to soften, without offering human emancipation to everybody. The difference, and this is the crucial question here, the difference between obliterating a privilege and making society more equal, gradually, that was the idea, you know, first the Jews and then maybe the actors, I don't know whether you knew that actors, theatrical actors, didn't have rights in the olden societies. They were not considered to be wholly adult, and so they couldn't vote, and so on and so forth. And for a long time, in most societies actually, it was basically considered to be a dishonorable occupation, along with prostitution and such. And, and uh, so, and this is, I think, here we have a general problem that will show to you the philosophical differences between socialism and liberalism and between a gradualist approach uh, of liberation of humankind and the revolutionary approach to the same. Uh, it sounds you know, mechanical, but it won't stay that way. Uh, you see, the good liberal of the 1830s, uh, later this has changed a bit, will say the following. Any gain in uh, any gain in, in, in achieving rights for a human group within a society in which the use and the general practice of rights is not accepted and is not achieved uh, legally and jurisprudentially and legislatively is a progress. Hence, societies will be improving considerably if such impediments were uh, uh, lifted. And the socialist, the socialist like Marx was then becoming, would say the following. Even if privileges apply to the majority, even if the most shameful discriminations, the most scandalous, the most morally unacceptable, as indeed discrimination against Jews has been for centuries, millennia maybe, uh, will be uh, uh, suppressed, that will still leave a modicum of unfreedom that will make any partial freedom into a privilege. What is the difference between a privilege and the liberty? There are many societies in which this is not something that goes without saying. Such societies are, for example, aristocratic societies in which privileges are considered to be constitutive of the freedom of a special caste uh, <coughs> and, uh, uh, or an estate or an order, as it was called in Europe. And that differential freedom, compared to other people's freedoms and unfreedoms, constitutes that group's differential dignity, its source of pride, and its sense and its function of superiority. If, for example, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, the priestly caste in most societies has been not uh, forced to work for a living and was supported by the community, <coughs> therefore their activities were not servile they did not serve their own survival, and therefore they didn't have to serve the usual way of labor, which is working for someone else and being paid for it, which is a servile condition. Nobody, according to Athenians, who has to work for a living, 
and therefore is paid by somebody else, can be a free person. So in Athens, as you know, no person who had to work for a living had the right to vote. And it's called the Banausia. It's called the condition, not, not a condition like slavery, but it's a condition of dependence. So therefore, all privileges and all relative freedoms are constituting relationships of superiority and inferiority, in other words, of hierarchy, and which is not to say that would be simplistic. Um, sometimes socialists will do that simplistically, to say that those freedoms then are no freedoms at all. That's not true. This is what makes the problem interesting. Because freeing somebody, liberating somebody, uh, offering them uh, the ability to control their lives and to make decisions for themselves and so on and so forth, unimpeded, and participate in public decisions, etc., 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 well, that's indeed liberating. That is indeed a progress in this sense, and for the concerned, is a source of uh, you know, increased abilities to do things according to people's aspirations and wishes and ideas and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> freedom as a privilege is the birthmark of a modern unfree society in which there is a dialectical relationship between freedom and unfreedom, between freedom and servitude. Uh, if indeed some people are free and some people are unfree, the hierarchical difference between them is a difference between master and servant, even if indirectly only. And also, in, within capitalism, of course it's a well-known thing, I, you know, I mentioned this the other day and have to mention it again, <coughs> Free labor, that means freedom of contract. You are free to choose between employers. You are free to sell your uh, uh, working time. That is your life. That is your essence. You are free to sell your essence to the exploiter of your choice. And, uh, well, you know, that's better than false labor if you wish. And you can maximize some advantages, but at the same time, and this is indeed freedom, but this has an added disadvantage to serfdom and to slavery, because by signing on the dotted line, you contributed a part of your freedom into selling yourself into servitude. <coughs> it is also a part of your will that goes into free labor and its application for survival in a society in which capital is owned by some and is not owned by all. Now, in such conditions, the relative conquest of liberty, the relative and gradual conquest of liberty, is increasing liberty, but also it's increasing servitude. It in, it's increasing servitude because if indeed you grant liberty to some categories, thereby you recognize the limitedness of that category, which is another limitation for everybody. In the case of Jews, in Marxist case, by recognizing the equality of the Jewish religion uh, with other religions, eman religious emancipation, and if thereby you know, some of the legal impediments in the way of Jews have settled wherever they wanted to, the professions they wanted, and so on and so forth. That meant the, the uncritical, rigid recognition of the givens of the Jewish religion and the concomitant and symmetric non-recognition of others. Hence, the contradiction of capitalism repeats itself. Every progress in liberty entails a new servitude, maybe easier, maybe more comfortable, maybe more hidden, maybe more sophisticated, maybe more subtle, but certainly in an other, in an other realm, in another dimension, where freedom increases, usually, not always, but usually also servitude, well, it's not increases, but it's reborn in some way. Therefore, 
granting privileges and while recognizing the freedom character of privileges, not denying it, not being hypocritical in this ultra-moralistic way, uh, means that sectional emancipation, such as religious emancipation, or you know, giving the universal vote to men, well, it's better than giving it only to five people, five percent of the population is better to give it to 46 percent of the population. Yes, it is an increase of popular decision. But, of course, as we know from historical experience, the universal, universal male suffrage has deepened the hierarchical difference between men and women because it shows in, in psychological and pedagogical terms in, in, in any respect, because it has shown, repeated, and made it even more accented in, 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 and, and emphasized in conditions of increased freedom, the difference between active and passive. The active citizen, the male, the passive non-citizen, the woman, and while in a caste society this was a question of birth, it appeared as natural. Again, the will didn't go into it. But when parliamentarism, when parliamentarism was limited to men, this was a moral judgment on the moral qualities and intellectual qualities and the desirable role of women in a modern society in which elements of liberty already existed. So the reformers, who actually enlarged the suffrage or democratic in this way, thereby, in a half-free society, agreed voluntarily into being uh, complicit in the inferiority of women. So, the increase, such an increase in freedom, it's always and unavoidably dual in character. It's ambiguous, if you wish, it's dialectical. It, it contains a deep contradiction. And while it is a progress, it would be hypocritical and unrealistic to say that this is not a progress, but at the same time, at the same time, what it preserves in privilege, inequality, and hierarchy becomes morally worse. Now, <clears throat> so therefore, for a good socialist that many of us aspire to be, it's not so easy to achieve, but you know, we can always make attempts. Uh, the question is not. how to do, how to achieve a kind of politics that gradually will extend freedom to newer and newer groups. Even if we recognize that this strategy is better than enslaving newer and newer groups. Okay, of course. By being idealistic and rigid in our theory doesn't mean that we have to be stupid. But, and, and nevertheless, 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 it's a question of principle. The difference between reform and revolution, between gradualism and radicalism, is not a question of degree. It's a question of substance. Achieving a free society cannot mean increasing the number of privileges for more and more privileged groups that only will make society a concatenation, a series of privileges that might actually fit to one another, but will still separate human groups from one another, and achieving a unitary humankind within which there's no real difference either in dignity in moral rank or inability to achieve your innermost aspirations and needs and wishes and desires, that those are two different objectives. And the unified mankind, humankind, 
in which it is not thinkable that freedom can be a gradual a system of privileges. So, you know, uh, a peace between freedom and hierarchy. That is not the socialist aim. That has been the aim of liberals. This is why liberals have tolerated slavery, they to tolerated colonialism, they tolerated women's inferiority, and so on and so forth. Not because they were nasty people, but because they thought that let's first liberate middle class white men, say, and then we'll go on like this. And, <clears throat> and there's nothing actually uh, to, to, to reject within liberalism this dualist approach. And you don't have to betray your ideal of human rights and liberties and so on and so forth in order to do that. But if you are a socialist, then you do betray your ideals if you agree to such things. And this is why it's still the crucial event in the history of socialism is the summer of 1914, which for liberals was, well, ugly and unpleasant and silly, but for socialists was treason. And that treason still separates revolutionaries from reformists because the consequence, the consequence of gradualism and reformism has been shown. Whatever else the revolutionaries might have done since, and they've done terrible things, as we know. This treason won't go away because it's logically following from the ideas of gradualism. What did gradualism and reformism mean in those times, and what does it mean today? But especially in those times when it had a real importance nowadays, uh, not so much. <coughs> the reformers are usually the reactionaries. Nowadays. Anyway, but <coughs> what, namely the socialists at the time, have accepted, for example, that backward territories should be liberated from monarchies and put under the control of more enlightened state force. I.e., you know, in Germany, Social Democrats were saying that a war against Russia was a war for progress because Russia was autocratic and nasty and awful, poor and so on. So the you know, French say, the French socialists say that they have to save Europe from German autocracy and Prussian militarism. That all existed. Russia was awful and Russia <coughs> militarism was pretty unpleasant. <coughs> so they wanted, even if we think that they were sincere, and let's for, for a moment suppose that they were sincere in this, to enlarge some advantages to benighted backward uh, you know, territories and uh, you know there was liberal imperialism in Britain you know the white man's burden was to civilize the blacks and all that kind of thing and some people may have believed in that and but the basic principle was that freedoms will be bestowed from the top on you know, the top of hierarchy, economic, military, etc., etc., hierarchy, on the benighted, poor, backward, nobody's down below. Well, a socialist cannot think like that. Because for a socialist, unlike for a liberal, equality is not an objective and is not an aim, it is a presupposition. Equality goes before socialism. Socialists start from the assumption of equality because they are aiming at much more. Aiming at, this is well known, you know, the liquidation of exploitation, of alienation, of reification, and of the separation of humans from their fellow humans and for themselves through the medium of wage labor and its consequences. So therefore, 
There is no way for a consequent socialist, really, to be a reformist in this sense. It doesn't mean that they cannot give tactical support to progressive reform. But those are, those are details. Important details. Important details. I will come back to that because uh, you know, there's not a political uh, talk, but, but I'll come to that at the end. So, you know, it's a question of principle, not a question of method. Then, what does then, let's go back to the, to the, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, fundamental idea. What is emancipation? Emancipation, you know, as you know, it has been, it's a Roman legal term, meaning the liberation of a slave through uh, the legal method of uh, uh, the uh, father, the f father of the family, the chief of the household, because slaves were legally considered members of the household, would give liberty to a slave. It was a sovereign decision by the head of the family, the pater familias, and so on. So that was already the sense of the word. And it remained enough of it to say that this was a decision of a liberation of a person who was dependent in his or her person on someone else's will. Now, we do nowadays consider in this conservative age that this is the natural condition of human beings of being dependent on others. You are dependent, of course, on your parents, on your state, on your supplier, you know, various other things. This is what we call today's society, interdependence. Uh, that's the general, you know, journalistic and vulgar sociological idea of, of society. And, well, certainly cooperation in a society is necessary, but cooperation is not identical with dependence. What's the difference? You may be needing cooperation in order to survive and to function properly in a society, whatever we mean by proper. And, uh, but of course, you are, if you're cooperating, you are choosing your method of cooperation and its environment, its context, and its milieu. A dependent person cannot do that. And lifting dependence not just the legally servile condition, is what emancipation, in a Marxist sense, consists in. Because you see, if a group is emancipated, and some other groups are not, and even other free groups see their emancipated, that is privileged position, being relativized by the emancipation of others, their relative rank in society is diminished, and so emancipation creates conflict. Envy, rivalry, competition, you know, what we consider to be normal society. Okay. Uh, you know, people get their salaries increased, and that may cost consumers a bit. So, you know, there are all sorts of interests in society in which lifting some impediment in the way of self-realization is not necessarily uh, socially and morally advantageous to all. This is what we consider in capitalism to be the normal state of affairs. But we are not talking about capitalism here. We're talking about communism here. And in a communist society, of which we possess only a theoretical idea, but that's not nothing, uh, such dependence, in which there is the uh, uh, nuance of rank involved, in which the weaker one depends on the stronger one, in which the lower one depends on the higher one, cannot exist, and it doesn't make any sense. Because communism means the emancipation of all. And this cannot be bestowed by nobody if it refers to everybody. There is nobody to bestow on others. 
because everybody is an agent in achieving emancipation. And when we speak of emancipatory struggles, we use it in two senses at the same time, in the practical, everyday political discourse. We are speaking of emancipatory elements in somebody's politics and so on and so forth. You know, it makes some, not much, but it makes some sense. For example, usually, uh, most frequently, the word emancipation has been used, uh, especially in the past, uh, in the case of feminism. Emancipating women <clears throat> meant to save them from their servile condition within the family and outside it. Now, so emancipatory politics meant not only giving material and even legal advantages to some group, but also changing quite fundamentally its relative position in society, which is also a psychological and a moral change. You know, giving equality to women, as all feminists know, and also their enemies know it very well, means changing the moral balance in a society, reducing the uh, relevance and the bite of the idea of a differential moral dignity in a very important way. <coughs> even in Germany, even the uh, hostile, witty word about, about feminists was and still is emanzen. Sie ist eine emanze. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and so, yes. But of course, but of course, you know, uh, feminism and similar advocacies of that being the most important and, and touching on most people uh, to be liberated, the majority of all societies, that is, uh, is related also and has always been related to socialism. Why is that? I've just been saying, I've just been saying that the partial emancipation of various human groups is an ambiguous and ambivalent uh, step in the liberation of humankind. Why am I making uh, a partial exception for feminism? Uh, at least conceptually. And <clears throat> not only because of my political sympathy for feminism, that's in this case is neither here nor there. It exists, but it's not decisive here. What is important, though, is that one of the most important obstacles in the way of general human emancipation is the shared idea of a difference in intellectual and moral dignity between people. Many people think that if empirical differences between people can be established, think of the uh, IQ things and such. Not that I believe in that, but let's suppose it's okay. For a moment, it isn't. And, <coughs> and <coughs> so an empirical difference in people's abilities, capacities, including moral capacities for freedom and dignity for exercising such that have been doubted by anti-feminists. There's a very important thing. Feminism was the first real effective ideology that inspired people to realize that empirical differences between people's abilities and other uh, uh, properties are not decisive in deciding morally what they deserve and what they do not. And that's absolutely decisive. So this is how we can, you know, liberate children and behave in a humane and universalist manner towards animals and so on. You know, one of my favorite quotes is from the uh, Hungarian Soviet Republic, whose uh, real name was the uh, Socialist and Federated Council Republic of Hungary, 
Okay? And a communist enthusiastic woman at the time was asked, you know, what, what's the essence of communism? She was a poet, a great writer, and she said, even the stones will be saved. <laughs> that was this kind of quasi-religious enthusiasm uh, of the early young revolution in the first days. <clears throat> oh, okay, the stones will be saved. You know, that's metaphorically, it shows that we refuse to decide between stones and non-stones. And we weren't. Also, we can't. Also, we can't. Because making a decision according to intrinsic value among human beings is based on a fallacy. Because if you decide between human beings, then you decide according to your belief in the quality of being human. And that's equal. So it's a fallacy. It's just, you know, the fact that our social practice contradicts it, that's of course so has many, so have many social practices contradicted common sense and reason and still do still do. And but this is a very important one. This is a very important contradiction. Now <clears throat> there is also a problem needless to say. In all theories or notions or dreams of liberation, the old dream of liberation presupposes the liberator and the liberated. Unavoidable. Because, you know, liberation is an action. Liberation is an action to liberate those who are not free. And that presupposes that some people are free and they can liberate those who are not. That's a mistake. Liberation means the liberation of unfree people by unfree people. And that is a very important aspect of socialism that doesn't suppose that there's a philosophical method of becoming unalienated and thereby being apt and free to disalienate the alienated. And, but then, if this is true, if this is true, how do we know that we are alienated? What is the archimedic point from which we have been informed that our relationship with one another are reified and that we are alienated and this is a common condition under capitalism? How do we know that while being alienated? <coughs> Georg Lukács thought, if you wish quite unoriginally, originally for a socialist, but unoriginally for a philosopher, that it was, of course, philosophy that will be the archimedic point. There is a method, a critical method, discovered by Marx, that even if it doesn't save us stones in itself but it gives us a method to recognize our negative characteristics of being alienated our inability to be free uh, in an unfree society to the unfreedom of which we contribute by living in it and, by, and thereby by agreeing to it any, you know, according to revolutionary ideology, every second spent unresistant in a capitalist society means being complicit with exploitation. Well, there are degrees of responsibility, but that there is a passive responsibility because, you know, capitalism is free enough to make any act contain at least a smidgen of the voluntary a smidgen of the free, and thereby our moral being is involved in unfreedom, even um, the morality of those who are despising and hating oppression. Now, <clears throat> so if there is such a critical method, 
that is available also to people who are bourgeois in the sense of being members of a bourgeois society even if they don't enjoy the material advantage of the bourgeoisie. We all have a bourgeois in us because by our very existence we agree to the continued existence of a bourgeois order even if we don't benefit personally or we don't consider to have benefited personally. <coughs> Liberals will tell you that, of course, you all already benefited. And <clears throat> but that's neither here nor there. What is important here is that we are living as socialists in a hypothesis, namely believing that we do have a philosophical, scientific, and moral method whereby we are identical with all the shortcomings, moral and intellectual and political and material of capitalism, and we can still see it by a constant intellectual and political activity. What does this sound similar to, if you think about it? How can an unsaved Christian in a sinful world be a true Christian by praying by exercising himself in alienating himself especially himself and herself from the world as it's called in Christianity Christianity is supposed to reject the world that's the world of the Bible right? the world. We don't belong to the world. Those people who belong to the world are the sinners. right? We, Christians, uh, try not to be sinners by praying, by meditating, by giving alms, by making sacrifices, by uh, abstaining from certain pleasures, by uh, being true believers and making sacrifices for our true beliefs and true faith, going to fiery death if necessary, but we are practicing and exercising all the time. A real Christian works all the time, you know, wakes up in the night and prays, resists temptations, hard work. It is, it is. <laughs> And, and, and I don't only mean sexual temptations, that's the hardest maybe, but there are also other temptations. For example, temptations of being contemptuous, being superior. That's called sinful pride, isn't it? So, and there is indeed, there is a parallel. A good socialist practices all the time. Does you know do the picketing and does the usual stuff that socialists are wont to do, including uh, spending sometimes some time on the barricades, if need be. If you know, it's not comfortable, but you know, uh, I never had the privilege, but the privilege, so I might. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> And you know, the thing is that, that by exercising rigorous scientific analysis, by being conceptually disciplined and ascetical as the best of the scholastics have ever been, and by trying to live as socialists in a non-socialist world that will earn socialists the same accusation of hypocrisy that all true believers have ever earned. And some of them were hypocrites. You know, of course, of course. Well, but even true believers have always been accused of being hypocrites. So were uh, hypocrites. And the thing is that this is our hope. This is our hope. And um, what is our faith and what is our charity? That's the question now. And I'm just half joking. And uh, our faith is exactly this. 
that through exercising, every great religious writer knew that, that you need to exercise constantly, from St. Augustine to Pascal, from the Gospels to Kierkegaard. They all knew that you cannot cease doing it. In that, all great religious writers are one. They may differ in everything else. And that's also not only Christian, in all, all major religions. Uh, and you see, and mine are probably, and you, you know, and the charity, the charity, the love that socialists exercise is behaving as though they would be emancipated and suffer the consequences. Because behaving as an emancipated person in a non emancipated society means a lot of disadvantage. Mostly, you know, they can be direct, but they're mostly psychological and moral disadvantages. Because, you see, a truly egalitarian and universalist behavior doesn't satisfy the notions, the current notions of success and the, of a, in a competitive society. And people renouncing this world with success, as it were, and careers and money and all that. You know, if you are true revolutionary, you won't make a great career in this society. And, uh, but, but these are only approaches, approaches of individual people to uphold the idea of universal emancipation until it doesn't happen. So that's not the most important thing. It's an important thing for our lives. But it is not important conceptually. What is important conceptually is needs an effort of imagination. And that effort of imagination refers to a process not born aloft by anybody which is purely abstract because a liberation that is without a liberator, emancipation without an emancipator, disalienation without a disalienator, and so on and so forth, that is difficult to imagine. Because we still, you know, that's all the iconography of revolution tells you, that there's a very strong person mounting on the barricades, you know, De La Croix and the rest of them since, and will liberate the weak and embrace them and bring them aloft, bring them up. Well, you know, this is not our ideal. That's the wrong, that's the wrong interpretation of the idea of a communist revolution. The communist revolution happens undone by anybody. It doesn't mean that politically is automatic, but it cannot be anything privileged as a doer. And this is, this is why it's not Prometheic. That was the French Revolution. That's different. So, basically, this is what I wanted to say. And now I'll go uh, into a few short uh, asides that will be political. Uh, not necessarily concretely political, but political. Uh, in a period in which not only communist revolution is an almost unconceivable ideal, but also more or less radical reform is very difficult to imagine in a deeply conservative reactionary age in which we live. Uh, you know, one is really tempted, I, I include myself in, in this one, one uh, to say that things are so awful that some partial reform, some advantage to one group is worth it. At least some people should be helped and say. Well, obviously, uh, that's, of course, a commonsensical proposition, and indeed such people should be helped. But what are the consequences? Are we not giving up on our ideals, as described sketchily by me before, when we are doing this? 
when we are making coalitions, let's use this ugly word, really ugly, really ugly, disgusting, really ugly word, when we're making coalitions with reformers, with do-gooders, with, you know, more or less sympathetic and well-meaning people who would, you know, lift some burdens, but by no means all. The question is, again, it's a moral question. Can we keep our objectives in sight when we are doing constantly something else? It's not easy to put it mildly. Because you see, uh, you know, it's, you know, as Brecht said, it is a greatest temptation to do the good. And it's a great temptation to do good. good indeed, you know, and, and for example, to save children from being physically abused, who would refuse doing that? Of course, they should be safe from being physically abused, obviously. But are we fighting child abuse? And chiefly child abuse. Are we going to be reformers who will improve this and that? Important things, and good things, I mean, yeah. That's or will you be able, while doing that, to see that any number of privileges won't result in freedom? And that what we are doing is relative, and it's valuable only in parts, and hence we as socialists are not at the height of our own ideals, which is a contradiction in anybody. It's difficult. So when you're doing something that is inferior to your highest ideals, that's called an inner conflict, if I'm not very much mistaken. But, that, but, but the inner conflict, because of being a commonplace, uh, is not thereby cancelled. Inner conflicts exist, and they're important, even if they have been dealt with by millennia of literature. And that is a very important, that is a very important obstacle in the way of realizing the communist ideal. Because you see, realizing the communist ideal is a question of conscience, a question of sacrifice, a question of way of life, a question of moral choice, and when compromising morally constantly in the service of a good cause. Well, that's why the greatest temptation, as Brecht says, of course, is doing good. Well, then, of course, the inner conflict is becoming, becoming the real condition of the socialist. You can recognize, and indeed, mostly, you can recognize people with a dual conscience, whether also very familiar from the history of religions, with a double conscience. Okay? Uh, one is being pretending to be an active citizen of a society in which, of course, there are no real active citizens. Active citizens exist only if participation is open to all. But we pretend, and we are using our own privileges as intellectuals, as politicians, as fighters, etc., etc., in order to help with some good cause, and that you know, purposely speaking, only of good causes. And so, before noticing, we have changed. And so we have, we do indeed become moralists. Not moral beings, but moralists. That's a difference. Moralists being the people serving the good cause. And having a clear, clear conscience and that means a problem for people who want to be outside bourgeois society because being a moralist is reconcilable with being a good bourgeois. Why? Because it allows a dual conscience. You can uh, consume you know, profits you can use profits, you can gain from other people's work, and still work for a good cause. Working for a good cause is creating the basis of a dual consciousness and creating the basis of a society in which there are good moral causes and where 
all at the same time, there's a moral inacceptable general situation, right? Condition, sorry, not situation, condition. So you can be a moralist and agree to an immoral world. And this is what we don't want, do we? And so therefore, revolution. What does revolution mean in this context? I'm not talking about it in a historical sense because that's just too variegated by many kinds of revolutions. But that does mean revolution in, in this context I'm, 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 I'm talking about. It means, well, unsurprisingly, a total break with the partial. Is a break in your perspective and your inner life with anything that is partial. It has to be total. Revolution as a state of mind is aiming at the universal purpose in which you don't recognize distinctions between people. And to a certain extent between living beings. And so therefore, the criteria whereby you judge your own actions must coincide with the objectives, the social and political and economic and scientific and technological objectives of emancipating a modern society in which production remains, in which expansion remains, in which people's strategic positions are improved without destroying ourselves and without destroying nature and without becoming bosses or underlings. And that means the revolutionary perspective by keeping in sight always the universal objective. And that differentiates as far as it's possible a revolution from a reformist and not the decibels they're using. And, uh, and you see piecemeal work, the work of detail is unavoidable, but losing ourselves in it as it happens so many times is not acceptable if you are really socialist. And that is the sense that Marx gives to the word emancipation. He does not recognize the emancipation of a given religious community as an authentic emancipation because it creates privileges instead of liberties. License was the name in Old English. Uh, that was the legal word. A freedom granted to some but not to others. That's license. And that, of course, came to mean other things since. And, uh, and we are not aiming at license. We are not aiming at privilege. We are aiming at liberty that can be either universal or not be. And, you know, this is why the actuality of a revolutionary attitude is so important in an age in which counter-revolution is winning. Because you see, there are periods of relative progress, loosening up, you know, when the conflicts, inner or outer, may not be totally decisive. But when you have indeed to get out under from real darkness, uh, then there's no time for much ever. So this is why we must, that's my feeling, that we must be ever more strict with ourselves and less strict with others. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, you were speaking in this last part about some kind of revolutionary attitude, but I still have a problem with, um, with trying to imagine what this mean in, in concrete terms. So I would like to know, uh, I, I believe that we are now in some uh, special uh, um, historical phase. Uh, Can you hear him? Yeah. Okay. We are in some special historical phase here in Europe. Uh, this is a historical phase of... Um, um, of some specific process we call uh, European integration. And I think we have two different, two opposing sides here. We have one that is uh, liberal or maybe even neoliberal, uh, which is uh, um, uh, based on some sort of European values. Uh, but then we have this other, uh, other side is very Eurosceptic. And this other Eurosceptic side, which is very popular in uh, Eastern Europe, but also uh, it's becoming popular in France and in Great, Great Britain, is kind of xenophobic, but it's the only side that is directly talking to workers. And this other side that is nominally more uh, universalist uh, is not, not talking with, with, uh, with workers. So I, I would like to know what do you think is the concrete position that uh, communists should have in this, in this time and place now? Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Both are worse, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. <you know. laughs> uh, well, but let's examine your hypothesis. That was just, you know, captatio benevolence. Yours. The uh, <laughs> uh, thing is that Eurosceptics are talking to workers. Well, yes. Because, because they're talking about something that workers are sensitive to, namely unemployment and competition for the workplace, that is indeed exacerbated by immigration. That's true. Competition for the workplace, is, it is exacerbated by immigration. But is an element of truth there, empirical truth, not always at present juncture, yes. And also, there, as I described it in my article on, on immigration and open democracy, there's also a competition between nations who are uh, sending their, their immigrants, you know, East Europeans and Asians, for example. There's a great competition, or was in Britain, between, say, Pakistanis and Afghans and Poles and Romanians and Hungarians. And, and so all this is true. And... But what are these people saying to the workers? That's you know, one part that they're talking to them, and they have some success in convincing them. But what are they convincing them of? You know, the usual stuff, you know, xenophobia and so on and so forth. And uh, not everything that the working class experiences and feels is a criterion for the workers' movement. In this, I'm very orthodox. You know, the working class has participated enthusiastically for two years in the First World War. Many workers voted for the extreme right, etc., etc. And it, in an ideal case, of course, the consciousness of the proletariat, of course, is identical with the most ideal sense of socialism. But this is not. This is. This is a contingent combination. Sometimes it exists, sometimes it doesn't. Henceforward, we should not consider any given attitude of the working class as automatically relevant for our thinking. We have to care about this situation. And because, of course, the alliance of socialism and of the working class that should not be unmade, but also that should be, shouldn't be transformed into an unprincipled compromise with whoever seems to speak in the name of the working class at any given moment. Most of the time, who was speaking for the working class historically? It was social, it was social democrats. Were they right? I don't think so. And uh, nor do I think that Eurosceptics and such like also, some of the data are dubious, but I, went, but I accept your hypothesis. We now know, for example, that Trump's voters, on average, have been wealthier than 
the voters of his opponents. So what? That's really not crucial. And also, I have my doubts about how universalist the, the pro-Europeans are. But first of all, it's a European Union, not a world union. It's the union of the pale face, isn't it? And also, it is a continental, mostly a continental union, that has been held aloft <coughs> and preserved by outside forces for a long time, <coughs> by the Cold War, so injected by the Soviet Union, and of course by America, and by Britain, and so on and so forth. And, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, quite an ingenious device of keeping some continental stability, because the whole world is afraid of Europe, and rightly so. This continent has been the origin of wars and of fascism and so on. That, you know, as I said, could be defeated only from the outside. It had to be the Americans and the British and the Russians who defeated fascism. We couldn't. So, you know, Europe was kept down and, you know, pacified and so on and so forth. Okay, but that moment has passed. The guarantees don't exist any longer. Also, there's no great totalitarian fascist danger in Europe that would conquer the world, because you see the post-fascist Europe is turning against itself. It won't conquer colonies. It colonizes the European countries and themselves. So, you know, uh, so, so I don't, so I don't, I don't uh, believe in the universalism and emancipatory uh, virtues of pro-European neoliberals. But even less do I believe in the virtues of Marine Le Pen and comrades. And we have not much to do with these people. Uh, taking sides in a conflict that is shaped conceptually and politically wrongly, that would be a very bad move. That would be a very bad move. So saying that, you know, you support you know, Brexit and Le Pen against neoliberals or vice versa would be both wrong, I think. So instead of these two, you have to show something else. Which is not to say that this is not a serious conflict. Of course, it has to be under, has, which has to be understood. Why is it? You know, it's an interesting question that preoccupies me. Why is it that people don't think that such an arrangement is satisfactory any longer? And why is it that an abstract statehood for a number of nations is not any longer considered natural or normal or reasonable? That's a real change in people's thinking and these things are important and they have to be dealt with by the left. And, uh, you know, I try to solve this with my theories of ethnicism and such, and, but that's just a theory. And uh, I may be wrong <laughs> also, yeah. but my impression is, nevertheless, that the problem is really with statehood in general. And that, and that the idea of ethnicism uh, that breaks with the characteristics of nationalism that, that linked nationalism to the state and preserved assimilation as the main method of uh, 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 Approaching of, of bringing together cultural and political nations, that doesn't exist any longer. Because changing the character of society through legislative and state measures and education and so on is not trusted any longer because the trust in the liberal institution is almost nil. So when people are planning, so, so this, is why, why, this is why, for example, oh, this is an important question. <coughs> if people don't trust the liberal institutions, as good shapers of a future life, and they're trusting in the usual reactionary manner some entity considered to be natural, as ethnic groups are considered natural, totally fictitious and totally empirically unprovable uh, way, but no, never mind, it's a potent myth that its predecessors had been. You know, culture instead of race, you know, it's almost the same thing. You know, so. And, and you see, uh, this is why I don't think 
that we should again step back and ponder too much the relative advantages of one stance or the other. Neither is ours. Neither is ours. <coughs> and, you know, there could be other conflicts of this kind in which we are closer to one party of the conflict than to the other, but this is not one, in my opinion, this is not one. Which is not to say that this is not an important question. It influences our lives. And again, some of our privileges will be endangered if the European Union goes. You know, white middle class people and the majority of us are intellectuals, hence parts of tenure's uh, membership of the middle class. <coughs> some of our liberties, some of our safety and security and stability and so on is going and that of course is a legitimate interest in a bourgeois society of any social group and, and of course the most seriously touched are of course the industrial workers but that's a general trend uh, in which the European Union is a side issue it is the transformation of technology and transformation of international trade, and transformation of the architecture of international trade, that is the primary, and the European Union is a bit player. Or I'm wrong. Now <laughs> <coughs> 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 you mentioned that um, fascism, European fascism had to be defeated from outside, but before during the lecture, you mentioned that uh, only relevant liberation is when uh, unfree people free themselves. No? So how then to conceptualize, for example, the lessons of uh, Leninist strategy of uh, um, avant-garde of the working class, or, for example... Well, thank you, that's a good question. Sorry? <laughs> that's the good question, thank you. <laughs> thank yes. you. Go yeah, on. Or, uh, for example, uh, the, the strong role that uh, certain socialist countries had until the end of the 80s uh, in uh, liberation struggles, with a huge <coughs> liberation struggles in Africa and Asia, or also if we go uh, back uh, to how to conceptualize uh, Jacobin's uh, liberation of uh, slaves in colonies or uh, their emancipation of Jews. No? Because you yourself mentioned uh, like uh, your um, 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 okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you yourself mentioned, for example, uh, Christians who have to practice their yes. faith, no? But uh, exactly they uh, represent uh, uh, maybe a, a different uh, a topic on which we, we could debate here, because uh, Christians are somehow uh, um, supported by a strong institution, even if they don't believe in it. The strong institution is here to uh, reproduce their ideology and they have it to confess even their fallacies and something. So it's a, it's a really a good question if uh, they would still practice uh, so strongly as uh, you somehow demand of socialists now if that institution wouldn't demand many of them to. Well, you know, you know that sometimes they were doing it against the institutions, but that's... I know, I know. Yeah, of course, I, 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 I know that you know. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, but but going back to the uh, to the oh uh, yeah yes another side issue socialist countries I don't consider Soviet style state capitalism as socialist just a terminal very little terminology no, I really don't and uh, although I think that that was indeed a state capitalism a very peculiar very specific very strange variety not like any old state capitalism. Uh, but anyway, but, but going back to the Leninist question that preoccupies me, as you could perceive, and you did, um, because that's, that's a great problem. And of course, that's the Leninist vanguard party, of course, is indeed dividing, dividing the job of liberation, and not exactly along the lines as I described them, as it, you know, it's, it's going like this, but, but I try to describe it in very, you know, not, not too long because it's quite late, uh, so very briefly. So you see, uh, 
Lenin has observed, and many other revolutionaries, he was not the only one. It's his whole generation. In this, he doesn't differ from Rosa Luxemburg, from Georg Lukács, from Bordiga, from etc., from a great number of revolutionaries of that generation. Again, it was the experience of the First World War. When people said that, you know, the consciousness of the proletariat goes that, only that far, okay, uh, and that it could have been it and its organization contaminated by nationalism, colonialism, racism, and all that. And uh, indeed, there have been racist and imperialist socialists and social democratic parties, and so on. Uh, and therefore, we need a group of armed prophets. Well, that's the term of Isaac Deutscher in his biography of Trotsky, isn't it? It comes, of course, from Machiavelli. And, uh, or of an armed school of philosophers. In what sense? These people are supposed, uh, and which is described in Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann, you know, that abandoning the world in their persons, but not abandoning the world in their struggles. Going underground. The Jesuit, you know, NAFTA, of course, modeled after Georg Lukács. And, uh, you know, saying that rejecting the world gives him the unique perspective that can liberate. And yes, there's an acceptance of, of uh, chopping the world into two groups, into liberators and liberated. Now, with the idea, the concomitant idea, that this is an instrument that will rather function like a uh, Wittgenstein idea of philosophy, that's like a ladder that you, you climb on, you know, when you want to, to cross the fence, and when you cross the fence, you throw the ladder away, and you go to the other side. You throw the party away. That was the idea of Lukács, for which he has been, you know, condemned as a deviationist in the first moments already. And he said that the party works until the power of the Soviets comes into being, and then it's transformed into the power of the people over itself, i.e. no power. And, well, he was hesitant and so on about this, but that was the basic idea, of course some tergiversation, postponing, and so on, of course, always plays a But, you see, the basic idea was that the party was not an instrument of exercising power, but only to conquering power and giving it to the proletariat. That was the original idea. And that, of course, needed even so a great deal of self-confidence, of philosophical self-confidence, namely the belief of being right about most social, most fundamental social problems, especially, of course, the class problem and the problem of exploitation, which is the same problem. And because class is constituted by exploitation. And uh, we know that this didn't, didn't succeed. But Lenin, although I'm not a Leninist, as you can see, but I'm an admirer of Lenin at the same time, because he has posed this question in the sharpest and most sincere possible terms. Very honestly, very openly, and very harshly too. But that was the first wave of a revolution that indeed still had the tasks of, as you said, of Jacobinism to be uh, achieved by it. And indeed, liberation of slaves or liberation of serfs in Russia, and so on and so forth, that was achieved by armed struggle. And that is the most radical way of coercion. And no coercion can be liberating. There's a contradiction there. Of course, I don't pretend to be able to solve it. Maybe it's insoluble. Nevertheless, nevertheless, what indeed, we cannot do much better than the Renaissance Vanguard Party has been doing. 
they have trusted their moral intuitions in the end during their action. Their action was based on a scientific analysis, not on moral intuitions. But the moral intuitions were guiding them, they believed, and they were guiding them to a certain extent, yes, in how to shape the fight. And, and also the fight shaped their moral intuitions. And this is when Lukács, of course, will address the problem of the evil that must be assumed by revolutionaries and so on and so forth. Uh, and the moral sacrifice of yourself, I mean, your sacrifice as a good person, is needed in order to be achieved, uh, for the Russian to be achieved, and to create a society for really good people. You know, Moses won't come into. You know. uh, uh, and and uh, the old idea that who achieves freedom won't be free himself or herself. Right? That's an old religious idea from the Old Testament. And, and you see, it is unresolved. It is unresolved. We know now that indeed the purest of religion has been corrupted itself. Of course, we know that. And there are excuses and attenuating circumstances, but that's not our problem here now. And you see, but something of these dilemmas and of these problems, I think, remain. And, you know, the very unfashionable problems of sacrifice, of is it selfish or not to keep your moral integrity when you may be, you should sacrifice yourself together with your moral integrity in the service of a superior cause. It's not an easy question. Some of the Bolshevik answers have been frightening. That's true. That's true. You know, the breast play the measure, take the measure taken, I think is the English translation, as the measure taken. The Maastregel. And uh, there's Tarasov Rodionov's famous one's famous novel, Chocolate, in which Two comrades talk, the one is the commissar of the GPU and the other is his prisoner. Two communists, and the one says to the other, you must give that false testimony before the court, because this is what the struggle needs now. Accuse yourself of most abominable crimes, and don't tell your wife that this is not true not even in private conversation. That's between you and the party, represented by me. It is our secret that you are innocent. Okay, I mean, you know, scary stuff. And it happened to be my mother's favorite book, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful book, you know, scary. What happened to Tarasov Rodionov, who wrote this book, The Apology of the Cheka? Well, he was shot, what? Uh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> he was executed. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm not advocating anything of the kind, most obviously. But what I am, I am advocating, in one respect, what is worth emulation, is the high moral seriousness of examining these problems. And that's, um, and there, you know, uh, look at you still okay. I mean, really, the problems, although unsolved, it's also a philosophical task to present the problem in a pure and rational form. And he did that and left us without doubts. Yes. So, um, only one thing in the in the original. So, uh, give me second thoughts. Although I'm not really sure, um, my own position on the on the on the issue is clear, and that's the uh, the idea of of a necessity of a revolutionary ascetism. It's a very ungrateful word, ascetism. Yeah. I mean, if I follow if I follow the logic of, of your accusation well enough. I'd say we could define ascetism as a conscious refusal to use one's privileges in order to attain a certain level of yes, more or less. comfort. Yeah. Uh, however, I the term is exaggerated. 
Yeah, but I think the, the historical context in which we find ourselves is one where the, if you want to call it neoliberal post-fascist or globalist state, leads an all-out assault on the privileges which were granted to certain sections of the working class throughout history. So we're talking about the dismantling of the, of the welfare state. Now I'm not dragging a very theoretical concept down into uh, a sort of empirical what to do is But I think it's very important because it also dictates the way that we perceive ourselves as revolutionaries. So, historically speaking, I think that the idea of linking asketism in this great morally Christian sense to revolutionaries has been, in the words of, in the words of Hal Draper, more associated with socialism from above than with socialism from below. So, and advocating for an extreme form of, um, sort of refraining from, from any um, pleasures of the world in order to change the world completely is a tendency which can turn a group of revolutionaries, of honest revolutionaries, into a sect with a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I don't think that we should give up being strict with ourselves and uh, lenient with others. I think that's a central aspect of being a revolutionary. However, I think the, the concept of uh, asketism is a multifaceted one, and we need to know if we accept either of those aspects, which is the one we're accepting, Ex especially in the concrete historical moment in which we find ourselves. Well, I'm conceding quite a great deal to what you're saying, yes. I think that's a very, very good intervention, yeah. And I would correct uh, what I said. Um, what I had in mind, of course, is not denying the pleasures of the flesh and all that kind of creature comforts that are easily available or whatever. It's not that. That would be also insincere because I'm not an ascetic myself. You know, this, that would be really mendacious. That's not certainly, certainly not my aim. And, but what I meant, of course, is uh, you know, a restraint, this kind of restraint in the political realm. And, uh, and well, of course, you know, there's a you know, moral code of a revolutionary, that's the thing a revolutionary won't do, but I give it without saying. Um, but what I referred to was indeed, indeed this, you know, the, the, the constant and rigid keeping to the final perspective, to the ultimate objective. And that's not easily exercised, and of course that needs also psychological techniques. But of course I wasn't you know, advocating any kind of sectarian, and with what goes with it, superiority and all the kind of thing, of course, no. that has been proved to be A, not very attractive, and B, not very effectual. Um, yes, no, no, sir. If I gave that impression, I should have formulated it differently. I stand corrected. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, in a certain sense, you still at least partially avoided the last question because the, the prime example yeah, that was given was the politics uh, of advocating um, for the welfare state, specifically defending the welfare state and, let's say, advocating uh, the reconstruction or, I don't know, revival of the welfare state at a time where it's being dismantled. Yes. And let's say that this um, kind of political position, um, I think, fulfills uh, pretty much all of um, your uh, criteria of being hypocritical in uh, in commas, especially in a time when the universal when the universal status of citizenship, i.e., those who are entitled to the welfare state, is shrinking. Yes. Um, so it is exactly and precisely a political problem, I think, of exactly of the kind that you were speaking about. Yes, uh, and here I can and give you a positive answer, because you see, I really do think that, that of course, uh, keeping the number of beneficiaries of a welfare state as large as it's possible, it's a worthy aim. And, uh, and it's not limiting, but enlarging a privilege. Also, there's also a difference there. 
And, uh, <coughs> and yes, but you know, I mean, you know what, what I mean is that, that our aim is not a welfare state, obviously. <coughs> but also, of course, you know, by doing politics, one has to know that a welfare state, especially a properly, smoothly functioning welfare state, that is kind and not bureaucratic and so on and so forth, is a great advantage to all its contemporary rivals. And it's worth fighting for. And uh, yes, but does this mean that we have to become social democrats? Well, no. And the political advantages, the political advantages of supporting a welfare policy won't be ours. So, you know, we are working for other people. So that's, that's perfectly okay. That's perfectly okay. If, you, if we know that, that, know that we cannot do it under false pretenses, that we are all those nice welfare social democrats with some reservatio mentalis in our heads. No. And uh, so that I know that that's a very, very thin line divided, of course, a very extreme thin line divided into two. But that would be the part of revolutionary politics, which is art and not science. Yes. Yes. OK. First you. Yeah. So uh, how do you see the communist elimination of dependence? In practical terms. Practical terms. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's always the no, 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 no. It was a serious counter question. What do we mean by practice? If that practice is uh, inaugurated by the liquidation of exploitation, then there, then there are answers to the question. You see, uh, if indeed production and in general economic and practical if you wish, activity serving the uh, uh, production of commodities in one way or another is not there any longer, where the aim of human activity is itself, where needs are the determinants, where well, then an equal participation in establishing those aims and establishing the criteria of authenticity of needs can be indeed a cooperative intellectual and moral venture and in which there are no commands and in which, and in, which in conditions of liberation uh, you can work out a code of dependence that you reject. When cooperation and the need for cooperation and when participation can take, uh, you know, coercive forms. And then, of course, a new politics begins that aims at the reformation of dependent relationships among liberated individuals and communities. I cannot imagine that in practical terms, as you said, because it's very difficult to imagine a really free society. Uh, but to the extent I can dream about it, you know, I think that a lot of critical and defensive work will have to be done, will have to be done in order to not to fall in the old precipices and the old tracks and traps and so on. Of course, obviously, and in that may consist you know, a real fight for independence for everybody. There's something like this, you know, this is how I can imagine. These are intuitions and imaginings and fantasies. Because, of course, we don't live in that world of practice. Yes, Aska. Uh, you presented a reading of Marx's Jewish question as a critique of the politics of recognition of identity groups. And that was very witty and uh, led very fast. However, uh, the Jewish question is also a critique of French Revolution and of bourgeois democratic state. And you hinted several times that bourgeois democratic state is more or less at its historical end. 
You also, yesterday in your talk, you also um, finished by presenting the abolition of the state as something that maybe is on the agenda. And I would like you to develop a little bit on this point. Yes, well, that will be my last answer. It will be brief. Uh, this is a question of socialism or barbarism. The state can be destroyed either by the communist liberation of humankind or by the ultimate chaos and self-destruction of capitalism. It won't be the same. And, and so when the proper bureaucratic, partly benevolent, partly malevolent state is dying, which we mourn and we laugh about and are glad, so mixed feelings. Uh, you know, that, that can end in tragedy. So I'm not celebrating it. When uh, people are in a rapacious, exploitative society are not defended by a public agency, they would be very, very lonely and, uh, and defenseless in this position. So that's, that's not, you know, the state can be destroyed in many ways. If indeed you are the victims of, of, of uh, uh, rapacious exploiters and, and oppressors and so on and so forth, uh, then, you know, people might really wish for a strong state to defend them. And that's one thing. And the capitalist version of the destruction of the state that started with neoliberalism and now it's becoming automatic by virtue of the chaos that has been created as a result, as well known from your own works, for example. And uh, so that, that may end in, in a real tragedy, in a real dystopia. I'm not advocating anything like that. Uh, statelessness without freedom can be the worst thing that can happen to people. So there's no doubt about that. And, you know, legality is better than the law of the jungle. Okay, very good. And, but is this an opportunity, that's your question, is this an opportunity for a communist dissolution of the state? Unfortunately, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. That, that's my answer. No, I'm, I'm very pessimistic about this. So this destruction of the state through capitalism, uh, I think it's a very threatening uh, turn. It's very interesting, you know, conceptually and historically. Indeed, it's very interesting. It's never been the case. But I mean, just consider. Consider the, the Trump government putting the end to the Environment Protection Agency. That, in our terms, is end of civilization as we knew it. But I'm not glad about that. And, well, thank you for your patience.